580 CFRA. You're listening to the Afternoon Edition, and we are joined, as always, by a Monday now by Kevin O'Leary, the chairman of O'Leary Financial, also Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank. Kevin, thanks for your time. Great to be here. Thank you. Uh, it was a bit of a tough start to the week, I guess, on, on the markets. Things were uh, lower after some, some tough reports that we got on U.S. manufacturing and whatnot towards the end of last week. A bit of a rebound, I'm gathering, down south today, at least, with some uh, some good news on the U.S. Uh, housing market front. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the problem we have in Canada, obviously, is this uh, continued decline in the price of oil. We're so tied to the commodity. The dollar suffered very badly. It was the poorest currency on earth today. Um, I think this is going to come to an end at some point, and people really don't look at the positive side of low oil prices. Obviously, it's terrible for Alberta, which has such a dependency on crude pricing, and of course is fighting uh, confusion at the at the government level these days. They're raising corporate taxes and royalties at a time when they really can't afford it, but it's just unfortunate. At the on the other hand, the rest of Canada that uses energy as an input cost. This is fantastic news. I mean, if oil goes as some pundits are calling for mid 30s, we're going to have gasoline as as cheaper the cheapest it's been in decades, and that's very good for the rest of our economy. So while Alberta suffers, the rest of the country can enjoy this lower input cost. And that affects a lot more people, obviously, uh, on the positive. Yes, it does. And so you know, while our challenge as as an economy is to diversify away from energy and commodities, and I think that can happen over time particularly if you can open up these Asian uh, routes and, um, you know, trade agreements that have been going on. But, you know, we, we are so dependent on the price of oil currently, and our 80% trading partner in the U.S. is flush with oil. They don't really need our oil anymore, and that's why the pipelines have installed. So we've really got to build these pipelines east and west to get what we do have still as an energy complex to a place where we can ship it around the world outside of the United States. We were talking about, you know, a six-year low for oil last week and down again. I mean, maybe it's a naive question, but why are there not some, some limits on the production? Why does it just keep just keep flowing despite the uh, the way it's fallen? Because what, what what's happening here is classic price war. I mean, if your cost of extruding it from the ground is $8 Canadian, which is the cost that Saudis have, you can afford to keep pumping while everybody else starts losing money. And so what you're doing eventually is, you know, basically using your own balance sheet, the Saudi Strait financially, so outlast the competitors to eventually shut in oil, and then, of course, supply will dry up. That was the theory, but it isn't working. Last week's rig count was flat. There's no d- deduction in rig counts. And American shale producers are doing the same thing as the Saudis. They don't care. They're just pumping oil and getting whatever they can for it. Our huge problem in Canada, which really we should address, is our oil is landlocked. The value of our oil today is under $30 because the cost of moving it to somewhere you can sell it by rail or whatever pipelines we have is so expensive that we're in a horrible place. This should be a great lesson for us. We should drive these pipelines through just the way we drove the railroads through hundreds of years ago on the benefit of the future generations. We really can't afford any more politics on this. We're in trouble here. You mentioned the loony briefly off the top and where it's sitting. Um, You know, news outlets have tried to do their positive spins this summer about, oh, more American tourists coming this way, more value for their for their buck. Where where is the loony going? How quickly do you expect a rebound to happen and and how much of a concern should it be? Well, there's a new concern emerging uh, internationally regarding the loony that's beyond just the price of oil. Obviously, we have political uncertainty. The world has seen what's happened in Alberta. Uh, when the NDP got in there and caused chaos in those financial markets, complete collapse in the price of housing and people losing their jobs. I mean, I'm, I'm agnostic to politics. I don't really care which party gets in where. But when you haven't been in power for a long time, as the case of the NDP, you have no bench strength to do anything. So you've got uh, teachers running the energy sector, and I have nothing against teachers. Very important role in our society, but I wouldn't hire a teacher to run my energy company, and yet. Alberta has done just that for their whole energy sector. That's probably a mistake. The world's watching that. And so the new fear on the loony emerging in the last couple of weeks is, what if the NDP got a federal mandate in Canada? That that probably collapses the loony down another five cents, or nobody really knows. It would be unprecedented because if you don't have any fiscal discipline on the provincial level with that party, and then you apply it to the entire country, 
that could be pretty interesting on the downside. Are you feeling like it's a possibility? I mean, we've been talking about the NDP being, um, I know you're not a political analyst here, we've been talking about them being a pretty solid contender in the opposition, but are you really thinking it's time to talk about what would happen to the markets, to the loony, to our economic and fiscal policies if we had an NDP government? Is that something we should really be looking at? Yeah, I I don't look at it. I'm I'm pragmatic. If that happened, I wouldn't want to be taking my capital out of Canada and looking for places that were more friendly to it while the NDP sorted out what they were going to do. What they did in Alberta was to raise corporate taxes at a time when they couldn't afford it and then didn't even say what the loyalty rates would be, introducing a tremendous amount of uncertainty into their economy. And, of course, it's in the process of collapsing. What I, what I think is going to happen is the other parties, um, you know, liberals, conservatives, are going, to be, are going to be able to point at the Petri dish of Alberta and say, if you elect that party to a federal mandate, the whole country will be in the same mess of this province. And that's probably what they'll do, because I haven't seen any sign of life uh, financially coming out of Alberta, and I know as a, you know, global financial investor institutionally, there's no capital flowing in there because of the uncertainty. So uh, you, and and I'm, you know, again, agnostic. I don't endorse parties. I don't endorse politicians. I've always wanted less of them from any party. But if the NDP were to get into Canada, it would cause financial chaos and a lot of capital leave. It doesn't mean the country goes away. It means it goes into a dark age for a while until policies are put in place. And what everybody has to understand in Canada is we are in a global competition. This isn't just, we're a a small country. We're 2% of the world's GDP. We compete with everybody. And when we cause our own chaos, as we can see now in Alberta, it really hurts those poor people. Yeah, I, I feel so sorry for people living in Alberta. Imagine one day your house is worth X, and now it's worth 33% less. Not because of anything you did. It's just because the political winds blew through out of your control, and now you have to deal with it. All right, Kevin O'Leary, we thank you for this. All right, take care. Kevin O'Leary is the chairman of O'Leary Financial. Also, Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank joins us every Monday and Friday here on the Afternoon Edition. It's 517. We'll be back right after this. The Ottawa.